Hello, Black family. Shaquita Graham here from AttackCoWeb.com, where we believe that the best way to predict the future is to create it. So here we are again, more killings on video, more of the same. We have our sister Corin Gaines and just recently Paul O'Neill. Also, have been, um, they, they were killed by suspected race soldiers. So there's a lot of chatter going on. There's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of anxiety and chaos. And in the middle of that, I want to say, what are we missing? You know, because when um, all kinds of crazy stuff breaks out, a lot of times we have to get focused and think, look at the big picture. I mean, I know for me, I'm trying to be, focused enough to just live my daily life, um, to make sure I don't become the next hashtag, my kids don't become the next hashtag. At the same time, we're mourning the death of this beautiful sister, her son um, left motherless, her other child left motherless. Um, we we're losing uh, black lives, like before we can even finish mourning the next um, the the um, one person, another person is killed, and then we have to have our loved ones be dragged through the mud. Talking about, um, you know, Corinne used her child as a human shield, and you know, all of this kind of stuff. And then, of course, the usual we have um, police or some suspected race soldiers that are saying, you know, hey, we investigated ourselves and, you know, we find nothing wrong. Although there are many unanswered questions, many details that we will not release, we know for a fact that we did nothing wrong. So this is the same cycle over and over again. And, um, you know, even in the midst of that, I've seen a million times where police officers managed to de-escalate and capture so many white people alive in scenarios where the white person has a gun, the white person is shooting people, or the white person is running over the police, or they shot at the police, or a combination of all those things. And as long as they're white, they, they manage to come home alive. I've seen at least 10 videos of this phenomenon. So... I am not one who needs anybody to tell me what I'm seeing with my own eyes. Nobody needs to explain to me what should have happened or what shouldn't have happened with my brother or my sister in the scenario. So I'm not even going to, you know, insult the intelligence of a lot of the black folks who stay woke. Um, you know, I'm not going to address the question of whether there was police misconduct by race soldiers in uniform. You know, we know what we've been experiencing since Africa was invaded and we were brought here as prisoners and remain here as prisoners as a collective. So the only thing I want to say is that it's crazy to get indignant and point the finger at a brother or sister who was allegedly um, committing a, a crime or being, you know, uh, I guess annoying or whatever, non-compliant, and yet you have countless black people being terrorized and tortured and maligned illegally with no punishment in sight. And as a matter of fact, the suspected race soldiers are rewarded. So where does this leave us? I mean, what's the big picture here? Because we already know the pattern. We know what it is we're seeing, but what are we, we really missing? And that's what I want to get into uh, because there are so many narratives out here. Some people believe that compliance is the answer. Some people believe that having money is the answer. You know, your people like Stephen A. Smith, like if you go out here and do your thing, racism doesn't exist. Some people just don't give a dang. People can be getting shot back to back to back and they're out here twerking, they're out here uh, riding on their boats, they're, you know, living in their six figure life. They don't care. And then there are some people that say this is genocide. You know, they're saying that Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And even though Trayvon or Tamir Rice is not my son, it could be my son. It could be me. And that has them on alert. <clears throat> and, and, and it has them fighting for their freedom. So if, if it's genocide, genocide, is, it's happened over and over and over again. So if we look at the patterns of genocide, we should be able to determine are we experiencing genocide or not. So that's what I want to delve into. What are we missing here? Is this a genocidal blueprint that we're seeing or not? So I want to um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm just going to go in depth here. So so bear with me. I'm going to be um, <clears throat> taking excerpts from this book, The Destruction of the European Jews. And I said I'm going to do a whole series 
on this. This book is over 300 pages. And I think the last interview or the second to last interview that Francis, Dr. Francis Press Welsing did, she said that everybody, every black person should get that book and read it. And um, I listened to my elder and I got that book. So let me share my screen and let's go in. <clears throat> All right, genocidal blueprint. Is this in fact, let's see, I'm trying not to make my screen too small or too big. All right, so is this, is this, um, a, this plan that's unfolding before us, is this a genocidal blueprint? Because in this book, he goes in detail about how the destruction of the European Jews took place. And this was a process over a period of centuries, really. Um, so basically, the way I'm just going to go into three ways or three ways that this plan unfolded, racist theories and lies, police and legal tactics and collaborators. And we see that it is very appropriate for us to be looking at Nazi Germany when we have people at the RNC apparently um, giving a hell Hitler salutes. So let's keep going. So the genocidal blueprint, the way that the plan unfolded in Nazi Germany, they use racist theories and lies, like uh, commentators on places like CNN and Fox News, where they say black people are prone to criminality, where, um, and, and then you have police departments using the mugshots of black young males as target practice. Then you have um, a politician as a forerunner to be the president right now, who says that Africans are lazy, good at sex, and good at being thieves. Again, racist theories and lies. As it, well, I mean, I'm not gonna go there. Anyway, now how did this unfold in Nazi Germany? the intellectuals and the religious leaders at that time, they tried to show that the Jew could not be changed and that a Jew remained a Jew. And they used a lot of racist theories and propaganda. Uh, they started putting Jewish caricatures in cartoons. And they also stated that physical, the physical attributes were said to be an indication of social behavior. We've seen that here in America as well. And some examples, this is a Jewish cartoon that um, portrays the Jewish man as someone that's trying to take advantage of the white woman. And the same thing we have with a black man here in America. Um, these same images persist, the same type of propaganda. The other thing that was used in the um, destruction of the European Jews um, that plan, as that plan unfolded and that, that genocidal blueprint, they used the police and legal tactics. And you can see this is a picture of this uh, tactical operation unit in St. Louis County. After you, you have all of the weapons, we have no weapons, and you need um, a tactical police unit to, to fight against us. Okay. So the mil military... The militarization of the police is being used, we can see here in America. And again, in, in Nazi Germany, from this book again on page 100, the author says that the military authority over civilians increased. A ground force was assembled that was to be engaged what was soon, which, in what was soon to be called total war. They didn't say that's what it was at first. They just said, oh, we need additional protection from hostile Jews and different things like this. So as the plan unfolded, they said, okay, look, we need to um, increase the military authority of the police and the army and all of this. <clears throat> and you can see pictures right here of the police terrorizing Jews and the police terrorizing black people. So it seems very similar, similar um, plan unfolding, all right? So then um, this, the author said, uh, this is what the, um, the, the uh, Jewish, no, I'm sorry, the German officers said, uh, quoted in, on page 115 of the book, we must convey the impression that we are just Whenever the perpetrator of an act of sabotage cannot be find, found, Ukrainians are not to be blamed. In such cases, reprisals are therefore to be carried out only 
against Jews and Russians. So they're saying that, you know, if something negative happens, we're, we're not going to blame in whoever did it. Or, I mean, if we don't know, just, just pick a Jew or a Russian and blame it on them. Okay. I think that we see that kind of thing too, where people have, um, they have, uh, you know, vandalized their own, um, their own property and said black lives matter did it or they um one one guy even shot himself and, and tried to make it seem like black lives matter did it so again very similar you know it's not it does it makes a lot of sense for people to say that this seems like a genocidal blueprint or a genocide slide that we are on <laughs> another thing that was used um, to to help this plan move forward was collaborators in Nazi Germany they made sure that they had people Jewish people who are collaborating with Jewish annihilation and that's why we have your Charles Barclays out here your your Sheriff David Clark that are participating in promoting the agenda of, uh, that black people should be harmed and that it's fair and it's right and it's just and it's the way that things should be. So then you have um, Charles Barkley saying things like, he's sorry that the young kid, Trayvon, got killed, but judging by the evidence, what evidence did you see? I don't think that the guy should have went to jail for the rest of his life, uh, George Zimmerman. He continues, he said J Zimmerman was wrong to pursue. He was racial profiling, okay? We can get, but, but, but anyway, Regardless of him pursuing Trayvon and racial profile him, he thinks that Trayvon Martin was the one who flipped the switch, a 17-year-old kid. I could beat up a 17-year-old kid. And um, he said he was beating up Zimmerman. And I mean, okay, so there, that's a prime example of a collaborator. And in Nazi Germany, you had the same thing. You had collaborators on page 75 of this book, the most important concentration measure prior to the formation of the ghettos was the establishment of Jewish councils. Jewish councils were kind of like a black caucus kind of a thing. And again, they used so many tactics. They did use the formation of ghettos as a way to um, impoverish and uh, basically surround the Jews and you know, more torture, but I'm not going into that. We're talking about collaborators. I'm just highlighting three things real quick. So the Jewish, the councils invoked German authority to compel the community's obedience. The Jewish leadership both saved and destroyed his people. And I don't know what they, what he means by they saved um, their people, but I can definitely see how they destroyed their people. So the Jewish leadership was that buffer between the German authority, the German henchmen, and the, the victims, the Jewish victims, the people. The Jewish leadership stood in between in order to force down um, German punishment, German uh, torture, and uh, uh, you know whatever laws and orders that they had. So um, what were some of the reactions? Okay, so we've seen this. So what were the reactions? So while the Jews were going through through all of this, how did they react? What were what was their strategy? What was their plan? So um, in the book it says, uh, the author says that the Jews of Europe had been confronted by force many times in their history. They were confronted by force. And during these encounters, they had evolved a set of reactions. So they had been subject to this type of mistreatment many times. Um, and they came up with ways of dealing with it. So let's look at how they dealt with this over the centuries. And he said it remained constant. So there were basically four ways. Two of them are basically the same. Alleviation. So they tried to alleviate themselves of the pressure, the um, torture, the terrorism by uh, having petitions, paying uh, payments for protection, ransom arrangements. You know, we see this now. We see people who feel like if they can live in Malibu, the police can't come in their house and handcuff them. Um, evasion. Some, uh, the author said that this was not really a tactic that was used very much by the Jews. Some of them did hide, but most of the time they tried to live in places where there was 
obvious anti-Jewish sentiments and laws and orders and different things. But um, they failed to escape when there was time to escape. Paralysis. He said they operated this way a lot. They looked on helplessly as cities and countries full of Jews vanished. Vanished meaning, he's using the word vanished, were killed. Um, the Germans were relentless. They had several different, what, um, what was called killing operations. And, and really quick, let me just kind of go into when I'm talking about race soldiers, I want to bring up this video. Let me see. Okay, there it is. So let's just see this because a lot of people don't understand why, um, you know, many people suspect that there are race soldiers in the police department. By suspicious police shootings. In the 60s, it was clear that the law enforcement was connected with the Klan in many of these communities. We've had so many cases where they say he was charging at me, I shot him. The police officer claimed they feared for their life, but the evidence shows the country the person was jetting. The report often fits a narrative that's more convenient for the officer. We have this pattern of police brutality and no accountability. A lot of them would just move from one department to the next department or fire from one task force and put on another task force. It's like a big circle that keeps going over and over. And so we have stop. Okay, so again, that's kind of just going into the whole scenario that you have with police tactics similar to what was happening in um, Nazi Germany. So back to the reaction of the Jews when they were experiencing all of these kinds of things. They, uh, we were at paralysis the third way. They looked on helplessly as cities and countries of Jews vanished due to killing operations. I'm going to go in detail about the killing operations and compliance. They were compliant with anti-Jewish laws and orders and terrorism and all of that. Um, the author goes on to say that preventative attack, armed resistance, and revenge were almost completely absent in Jewish exilic history. So out of all the times that force was used against the Jews, they almost never um, had stage preventative attacks they never use armed resistance or revenge and you know they basically resorted to complying although they were met with a lot of uh, egregious aggressive force and that's similar to what uh, our representative john lewis said he advocates as the way to go he said that we have the capacity and the ability to just get up and move in an orderly, peaceful, non-violent fashion, even though we're being faced with militarized and aggressive police that, you know, have a history of killing and torturing people in our community. He says that, you know, he was beaten bloody by police officers, but he never hated them. And, and he said, thank you to the police. I wonder if any Jews had that, that, that same um, mentality when they were beaten by the police. The author says that they remain compliant. And we can see, you know, these similar types of reactions from black people. This, this article says that the Baton Rouge is passionate and peaceful after the shooting of Alton Sterling. They're playing their trombones and they are just peaceful and, um, you know, compliant just like the Jews. Here we see a barbecue with the police officer. We have the, the kids, some that look around the age of Tamir Rice who was shot by a police officer at a barbecue. Black men taking pictures with the police officers who kill so many black men every year and every week at this point. Very similar. So what were the results of um, these types of reactions? The author says that the German bureaucracy was not slowed by Jewish pleading. It was not stopped by Jewish indispensability. Because some people said the Jews, oh, the Germans needed Jews because the Jews were um, a pretty successful bunch. Um, they were scientists, they were intellectuals, they were making good money, they were business owners. Well, 
uh, the author says that with, without regard to cost, the bureaucratic machine operating with accelerating speed and ever widening destructive effect proceeded to annihilate the European Jews. You know, when I watch, um, you know, I don't watch the news, but when I watch what's going on, I see an accelerating speed, it seems like, of killings in our community. And um, so the author goes on to say that the Jewish community was unable to switch to resistance. They, instead, they increased their cooperation with the tempo of the German measures. It's amazing how I've heard so many black people say that, you know, we need to just be compliant when we are stopped by race, suspected race soldiers. That's what the Nazis were. They were race soldiers. They, their plan was to kill even though, you know, we'll talk about some of the methods that they use. But anyway, the um, Jewish community, unable to switch to resistance, increased its cooperation with the tempo of German measures. Thus, the Jews hastened their own destruction. All right, so what we're, we're in the solution again. What were the results now? In America and in, in uh, Nazi Germany, we see similar language. This right here is a book that was written by an American. It's called The Ultimate Solution of the American Negro Problem. And then in Germany, they had what was called the final solution. And they called the Jews, um, they referred to Jews as the Jewish question or the Jewish problem. And I'm going to read a little excerpt from the American version of this program and this idea um, the ultimate solution of the Negro problem, okay? Um, in the preface of this book, it says that the plan proposed in the following pages is advanced as a radical remedy for the evil caused by the presence of the Negro race, which so seriously affects the national welfare. Okay, so I'm sure that David, uh, Sheriff David Clark and Charles Barkley don't recognize the fact that there are white supremacists out there trying to devise a remedy for the evil caused by their presence. And they feel that it seriously affects the national welfare. And some of those people work on the police force. Now, how did they refer to it in Germany? In Nazi Germany, um, on January 20th, 1942, they held a final solution conference. Kind of reminds me of like an RNC kind of thing. <laughs> they were, at this event, they were unveiling what was called the final solution of the Jewish question. And that's on page 166 of this book. So let's keep talking about results. Again, the author goes on to say, because there was a lot, like I said, this book is over 300 pages and I can break this down for months. Do you hear me? So anyway, I'm just going to go with some quotes about the killing and the destruction and the results um, that the Jews faced um, in the midst of the reactions that they put forward as a, as a um, response to the force that was uh, being or the war that was being waged against them. So the author goes on to say, the number of transgressions by the military personnel against civilian population is increasing. It has also happened lately that soldiers and even officers independently undertook shootings of Jews or that they participated in such shootings. Now this, this comment was in the context of the, the um, soldiers and the police and all of these um, these units that were put together for a killing operation, they just started getting real wild with it. They just started killing Jews whenever they just felt like it. They just started shooting Jews. And they wanted the um, officers in the establishment really wanted them to kill on command, so to speak, and not just to be out um, without command, making, making uh, just killing people randomly. They wanted to be very methodical. So the shootings which took place in batches, this is the operation, the methodical um, uh, way that they were going about the killings. They call them mobile killings. The shootings which took place in batches of 40 to 50 along a two-mile stretch were too slow for the Romanian officers. 
So therefore, they took the Jews and they crowded them into four sizable warehouses and sprayed the Jews with bullets fired through holes in the wall. So they just got behind the wall and had holes in it, put all the Jews in a warehouse and just shot all of them, just shot all of them. And then the warehouses were set on fire. The mobile killings had become the operation of secret security, the police, and military units. A German intelligence officer says that the Jews are remarkably ill-informed about our attitude toward them. Even if they don't think that under German administration they will have equal rights, they really believe that we will leave them in peace if they would just mind their own business and work diligently. Hmm, I've heard that before. Oh, if you just comply with the police and if you just, um, you know, pull your pants up and if you just go to college, you know, hey, white supremacy won't affect you. Racism doesn't exist. And the German intelligence officer said that the Jews who thought like that were remarkably ill-informed about the attitude of the Germans against them because the Germans said we have a final solution. And again, this was after a, pe a long period of time. This, this plan was underway. So the mobile killing units killed about 500,000 Jews in five months. Now that was with, they had several sweeps. They had what was called a first sweep, a second sweep. They had deportation, immigration. They used all of those buzzwords. They used Oh my God, there's so much to tell. I'm gonna just stop there. We know that um, they say in excess of 6 million Jews were killed. Now, what were we supposed to do again? When we get stopped by suspected racial soldiers, when we are um, in a genocide slide, what, what is the protocol? So when we see these uh, killings on camera week after week, um, they said that at, at a certain time, the Ku Klux Klan was uh, lynching at least two black males per week. And, and we know they, they lynched black women as well. So now how are we supposed to, to deal with this if the ultimate plan is something like the final solution in Nazi Germany, where although you comply and you got out of that police stop, eventually the whole neighborhood is, was going to be taken and put in a warehouse and shot through holes in the wall? What if, I mean, what if that's true? Like, what if what Dr. Frances Cress Wellesley, who spent over 40 years of her life studying race and psychology and actually went to Nazi Germany and also debated races, said that we are in a genocide slide? What if that's true? How are we supposed to respond again? Again, Shaquita Graham, founder of AtecoWeb.com, you know, where we believe that the best way to predict the future is to create it. I think that technology is a major key for us because we, we may be in genocide 2.0 here in America. Again, thank you for watching. I hope this was informative and constructive.